So when this woman, when a woman would come to faith in Christ, she had to carefully count the cost. She knew that she could lose everything if she became a follower of Jesus Christ. She knew that. But she also knew that she could gain everything. You see, Jesus in Matthew 19, 29 said, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. And so, as the Apostle Peter is writing here, and he says in verse 1, Likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. The question is asked, is he saying to the Christian wife that she's nothing but a doormat? She has no rights? No, that's not what he's saying at all. What he's doing is he's instructing her. He's instructing her concerning the value of her husband's soul. And he's saying graciously submitting to her husband, even when he's aggressively disobedient, is a way of showing love for him. And so in verse 1 he says, you wives be submissive to your own husbands. He says that and goes on to say that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of the wives. So he's saying in this submissive attitude, you're going to live a life that actually is going to be an evidence that there are changes taking place in you that are the result of your faith in Christ. Now, he says that they may be one without a word. So that helps us to know that he's, he's not saying divorce him. He's not saying argue with him. He's not saying preach to him. He's not saying give him ultimatums. Instead, he says submit that he might come to Jesus Christ. Now, when he speaks of submitting, that speaks to subject oneself. It speaks of obeying or arranging under or being subordinate to. By submitting to Christ and your husband, in other words, you may win your husband's heart to Jesus Christ. You know, when you first get married, you have this entire life that you're beginning to, to um, enjoy together. And it's just really interesting because before you get married, you had your dating relationship. And, and even if it's a long relationship, it's not equal to a marital relationship. And, and often when people are, are dating, they, they put their best face on. They put their best foot forward. You know, as a kid, when I wanted to see if I could take a girl out, I'd possibly give her a call and speak to her. And, and I'd ask her something like, um, would you like to go out? And if she said yes, the next question I would be asking is, what would you like to do? Where would you like to go? And then when we go together, I'd ask questions like, what do you like to eat? You know, what kind of music do you like? You know, and I, everything she said, it would just be amazing how it was exactly what I like too. Oh, you like that? So do I. Oh, you want to go there? So do I. You like country western music? Hot dog. So do I. You know, anything you like, I like too. I mean, it's just amazing how, how we got along, you know, and, and, and all of that. And, and yet ultimately, you know, she came to see through that. It didn't take much time. I didn't like everything she liked. I didn't want to go everywhere she wanted to go. And that comes out pretty quickly. When I, I finally met Marie, who ultimately became my wife, I had made a decision at that point. I wasn't going to play that game anymore. I figured she's going to get to know me before we get married to whatever degree is possible in that relationship. And so instead of calling her up and saying to her, uh, where would you like to go? I would basically say to her, you know, Marie, I wanted to go and see this or do this or, or go to this restaurant. Would you like to go with me and so she got to know what kind of crumb I was you know without me putting on the mask she, she got to know what I was like just because I was trying to be real with her I wanted to be the person that I actually was and not the guy who was always trying to put on and be and do the thing that pleased her because I knew that ultimately if it was to go as far as I wanted it to which was marriage I knew that that we she would find out who I was anyway she might as well know now because why surprise her when we get married and, and it worked it worked well you know everything I like she seem to like I, I, I wonder if she was doing to me what I used to do anyway and hmm I'll have to ask her about that no but the bottom line is is when you have a relationship with somebody you get to know them and and if you're dating well it's like two independent rivers that are running side by side that eventually join into a single river and at the point that it joins there's going to be that chaos there's going to be that upheaval there's going to be that place of joining that creates all of that movement but eventually it goes on and smooths out i was talking to some young men just recently who are married men and recent marriages and all and and one of them said you know it's my first year of marriage and we're making some adjustments and i said you know that's what happens man and it goes on 
forever. You know, it doesn't ever stop. You will always be adjusting, bro, and you'll never really truly adjust. And, and when you finally are just laying in that box and they're saying good things about you, then you've adjusted. Not until then. It, doesn't, it isn't going to happen, bro. It's not going to happen, so get over it. No, as we were talking, you know, I was saying that's what happens. They said two independent streams have run into one and have begun to be together. And at that point, you're going to have your problems. And it doesn't end in a day. It doesn't end in a month. And those problems don't stop in a week or a year. It, 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 it can continues on because that's just the nature of relationship as you continue to grow and she continues to grow there are things you have to hash out and that's okay there's no problem with that at all as long as you're centered on the things of christ and you learn to uh, adjust to each other marie was talking to me the other day my wife and she was saying to me you know i think that if, if you can make it 20 years you probably can make it in a marriage and I said, yeah i think 20 years that's a long time if you can make it 20 years i think you're right baby if you can make it a week you're doing fine if you do it a year you're great three four five seven years there used to be an old saying called the seven-year itch and the whole point that they were making is if you made it to seven years and you could get past that seventh year you're probably going to continue on and remain married there's some degree of truth in that longevity really does help and you have to make those adjustments so a woman is married to the man men are being married to the woman and they're having to make adjustments and part of that is is how we're going to run this house and is there a leader in the home and who is going to lead now in a home that has a marriage of a woman who's gotten saved and her husband is not can be very very difficult and that's really what Peter's talking about here because it's not always true that the man will come to know Christ as Lord and Savior and that's why Peter is saying by submitting to Christ and to your husband you may win your husband's heart to the Lord Obviously, not every unbeliever will be one to Jesus Christ, and some will refuse to the very end. But he's saying this may be how they get saved. Now, why is it difficult for a woman to submit to her husband? Well, let's ask another question. Why is it difficult for us to submit to authority? Period. Why is it difficult for, for me to yield to authority, let alone a woman in a marital relationship? You know, because human nature, being what it is, rebels against authority. That's just human nature. We have a tendency of rebelling against authority. And so we're driving on a freeway, and it says 65, and to us, that's a suggestion. The number 65 is a nice suggestion, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's speaking to me. It's speaking to everybody else around me, but it's really not talking to me. And the only time it really is talking to me is when a black and white is behind me. Now, I realize that in 65, I put it on cruise control, model citizen. Or when you get to the stop sign, the word stop, you know, has variations to it, you know, degrees of that. I mean, as long as I'm rolling, you know, and, and kind of stop, doesn't that count? Well, no, I don't think so. The yellow light, which is a warning light, an amber light is a warning light, is really, you know, just kind of like equivalent to the start of the Indy 500. Let's see how many cars we can get through it, you know, before it actually turns red. I mean, that's the way they human nature is we have a tendency of rejecting authority 